So if you get nothing here, you'll have plenty to thank God for there. But it says, if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. So everything he would be inheriting, we're, uh, we're going to share with him. If so be, so now we have a condition, right, when you see if, so that's suppositional. So if, if so be, that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now that almost puts a little sting at the end there. You know, you don't want to hear about the suffering thing, but um, that is part and parcel to the Christian life. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And Jesus said, Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and speak evil against you for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Really kind of dovetails with what Paul's telling us here. Now, if you're students of eschatology, you've read the book of the Revelation, and you know that the book of the Revelation holds a lot of mysteries about the future. But it also gives us kind of a, um, a retroactive look back at history as well. In the first three chapters, in fact, chapters two and three are really a, a historical picture and preview of uh, the world that was to come. And, the, and now as we look back, we see how it all played out in history. Um, so, uh, some of you are familiar with my uh, time charts from Revelation, so this is just review. But we have the idea here of the church at Smyrna. It's the persecuted church, as a matter of fact. And this church at Smyrna, uh, well, if you if you go through church history, and there, there's several di different church histories that have been written. Erdman's has probably the, uh, I don't know, what can we call it, the slimmed down version, right? The light version. But uh, Schaff, Philip Schaff is known probably as the most exhaustive history of the Christian church. And as you read through the history, as he calls back through the annals of time, and uh, you begin to see how it dovetails so much with what was prophetically uttered about what the church would be enduring and going through during this particular age. Now, the church in Smyrna, it's the second church mentioned in Revelation 2, so uh, it's, it's the second phase of the church. It's the next generation, as it were. So we've got the first generation dying with John uh, at the end of the first century. So let's put it at 96. AD. And thereafter, what happens? Well, persecution starts arising. In fact, John himself is, uh, had been the object of great persecution. He was the pastor at the church at uh, Ephesus, as a matter of fact. And then he was uh, imprisoned and placed on uh, what was considered the Alcatraz of the first century, which was the Isle of Patmos. And from thence, he receives the glorious vision of the revelation. Uh, but what happens after John? John, uh, we have the next generation. Polycarp is a student of John, for instance. And then we have Tertullian. We have Justin Martyr. Uh, we have Irenaeus. We have Eusebius. And uh, these are what we uh, are referred to often as the church fathers. Not that they were Roman Catholic priests, but uh, patristic writings that would indicate that, the, you know, they were, they were the leaders of the church during those centuries of time. So now we're into uh, past 100 to 200 and 300 AD. And uh, so uh, we could uh, illuminate uh, some of the history just from some of those pictures I have up on that line. And also you'll see what's happening with secular history at the same time where the, uh, we have the Caesarian uh, dominance uh, one after the other and they become increasingly more fierce with their persecutions of the church. So this is an age of tremendous persecution that's happening uh, during that particular time. Also at the same time Satan's not happy with just killing Christians. He also wants to infuse false doctrine into the church and so we have heretics that rise up during that period of time and uh, I mean we could spend time on each one of these various cults uh, and uh, you might not know anything about them, but I can tell you what, uh, they may not have the same names, but really the same false doctrines are being promulgated as we speak, as a matter of fact. So uh, they all have uh, various modern permutations of these various movements and cults and uh, heretical teachings. Uh, but we're not going to get into all of that. I just want to demonstrate that the Apostle's warning us here about suffering. And in the 18th verse, he'll tell us of the ultimate victory. Uh, I reckon that the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So, uh, you know, it kind of uh, emollifies the hurt and the sting that that 17th verse may bring to us. You know, in the book of the Revelation says uh, to the church of Smyrna that you have 10 days 
uh, of persecution, but really speaking about epochs or times, uh, arrows of time, uh, and particularly I think the 10 Caesarean uh, persecutors that came after Nero. Uh, you could follow again in now profane history for that matter, you don't have to go to Christian history to find out these, uh, these various uh, leaders uh, and what they brought to the church during that time. Now, so it leads us to what was happening to the church and what we see kind of foretold here is that persecution was going to arise. At first, uh, we would have to think that the Roman Empire kind of takes it in stride, you know, just these foolish uh, Christians, they're deluded and so forth. But after a while, they began to uh, uh, multiply exponentially, and it was very difficult now. Now the Rome was starting to recognize the Christians as uh, almost being an impediment to their false gods and their worship of Caesar, who was the living deity at the time. And the, so they began to consider the Christians to be a great threat. And so the persecutions began to arise steadily. Uh, so from some of the writings of historians at that time, the Christians were accused of disloyalty to their fatherland. Uh, they were accused of atheism. That sounds really strange, but because they believed in one God rather than all the gods, you know, the gods that the Romans had inherited from the Greeks and the Greeks basically uh, had inherited from the Egyptians and the Babylonians. I mean, they're all the same gods. Uh, and today we call them Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, Wonder Woman, whatever you want. They're all gods. They're the false gods. Uh, they just have different names today. Uh, so you, uh, at this time, Christians uh, were considered atheists because they only believed in one true, living, and invisible, immortal God. So uh, they were seen as a threat. Uh, and uh, they were accused of hatred towards mankind, of hidden crimes and such as incest, infanticide. And uh, they were even considered uh, cannibalists. They believed that the, the eating of the communion, uh, where symbolically they were taking the body and blood of Jesus Christ, they, uh, they were being accused of being cannibals. Uh, likewise, they were held responsible for all natural calamities, such as plagues, floods, famines, etc. Uh, and so they were viewed as a great threat to the uh, Roman uh, uh, corpus of, uh, of politics. So the Christian religion was proclaimed strange and unlawful. We have, again, now we're going to take uh, now secular historians at this point. So uh, it was a senatorial decree in the year 35. Uh, they, can, they call them deadly Tacitus, referred to them as that wicked and unbridled Plinius uh, new and harmful, Suetonius. Uh, these are all, again, these are secular historians referring to what was happening at the time and chronicling the rise of Christianity, mysterious and opposed to light. Uh, and Asius, and then um, uh, they were outlawed, uh, hateful uh, by Tacitus. Therefore, it was uh, outlawed and persecuted because it was considered the most dangerous enemy of the power of Rome. Uh, which was based upon the ancient national religion of the emperor's worship. So it was all about worshiping the emperor. Now I'm going to turn to um, a film that I had assembled back in 2012 when we uh, did the whole book of Revelation. And I want to take an excerpt now from the church at uh, Ephesus and then Smyrna. During these early years, the gospel spread throughout the Roman world. Thousands of these benighted pagans were being swept into the kingdom of God. Christian churches rapidly proliferated throughout the major cities of the ancient world. At first, the Roman authorities looked on with a mingled spirit of toleration and amusement. But by 66 AD, the Emperor Nero was no longer looking on with amusement at the force with which Christianity had taken root in his city. In hopes of transferring blame for his incineration of Rome, he indicted the Christians who were proclaiming the end of the world. He ordered the execution of Paul and thus opened the door to the next era of church history. Other emperors would take up the bloody cause until every apostle would be martyred except John, who was exiled to a prison island called Patmos, where he received the glorious revelation of Jesus Christ. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, 
These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. The persecution was steadily intensified after Nero until it reached its fiendish climax in 303 AD with Diocletian's horrific edict of persecution. Bibles were confiscated and burned in public view. Believers were flushed out of their hiding places in the catacombs and fed to furious beasts for public enjoyment. They were mutilated by wild dogs and crucified and then set on fire to provide light for the pagan feasts. Yet, through these years of unbelievable barbarities, the church continued to proliferate. God raised up his faithful witnesses, such as Ignatius of Antioch, Papias of Hierapolis, Clement of Rome, and Polycarp, who was himself martyred at Smyrna. These, with thousands of others, sealed their testimonies with their life's blood and gave credible witness to that generation that there was a power that could transcend the worst torture Caesar could marshal against them. The empire had lost the furious war that they had waged against Christ and his church. The public spectacle of Christians facing the angry jaws of the beasts or the inexorable flames of the stake with unshakable peace proclaim the power of the living Christ, a power that Rome so savagely sought to destroy. In the same Colosseum where the triumphant Olympic athletes were crowned with a laurel wreath could now be seen the saints of Christ being rewarded with a martyr's crown. But the church triumphant was about to face a far more deceptive time of temptation. Just to elucidate the point about suffering, if we suffer with him, we shall all be glorified together with him. Uh, and certainly it could be said for the first uh, 200 years of Christian uh, existence, the existence of the church, it was a persecuted time and, and people went through uh, barbarities that are indescribable. All of this is important for us to recall often. This is the heritage of the believers. And uh, we live in such a soft generation. And uh, I mean, it's hard for us to relate to all of this because all we've known is freedom all of our lives and just assembling like we do here casually here tonight. It's, it's like something we take for granted, but it really wasn't that way in the first century. Uh, and it was warned here and throughout the epistles that one could expect persecution. Uh, Peter writes about this persecution here in the fourth chapter. He says, Beloved, think it not strange, the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. You'll see how this dovetails exactly with what our verse is that we're studying here, the 17th verse, about the glory, which is the hope that is laid before us, you know, and that the suffering is temporary. Uh, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Uh, so on their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. So whatever little things that we may endure here, persecution, family mocks you um, because you're following Jesus now, or whatever uh, trivial things that we endure, it is all part of the sufferings of Christ, and it's something that we embrace. And in this case, in fact, Christ is glorified in that suffering. So we turn now to the 18th verse, uh, which is a consolation. So 
For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be uh, compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. In us, by the way. So that uh, we're really talking about uh, the spirit that now lives in us will manifest our entire being uh, in the resurrection. Now it's Paul that writes of uh, Philippians 3, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. So we all expect as believers to go through sufferings, and it's plural here, so that we understand it isn't just one time that we might go through it. It's, it's, uh, it is the common experience of the believers. So sufferings, plural. Uh, and it says being made conformable unto his death. And, and this is what believers, again, in our soft generation, we're not used to this sort of thing. We want comforts. Uh, what's the modern church now is offering, uh, you know, lattes and coffee between, you know, to, they have uh, uh, refreshment stands and people kind of come and go. And, and church is a very casual event. And preacher's uh, a buffoon in most cases, you know, and tells uh, stories and doesn't really give the gospel out and give some pop psychology. And that, that, that appeals to the flesh. Um, and one can hardly imagine what it was in the first century when you're hidden somewhere in a tomb. The catacombs were nothing but tombs, underground burial vaults. Uh, the stench of putrefaction filling the atmosphere. And yet the saints glad to have a place where they could hide to worship the Lord Jesus Christ and to gather and to sing, just like we we're singing here tonight. Again, this is something we just take for granted. You know, we could take it or leave it in some cases, but... But in the first century, it was so vital to them, the fellowship of the saints, to be involved in this because they were facing persecution. Uh, they could maybe even come and share how somebody had just been taken away, fed to the lions. And this was the experience of the martyrs of the catacomb. And Paul here speaking about having a fellowship with the sufferings of Christ. It's not, again, over and over again throughout the epistles, this is mentioned. This is something that is uh, to be expected, as it were. Amen. Colossians tells us, and I, Paul, uh, am made a minister who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. And Philip, that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now, if you unravel all of this, we saw last week that list that Paul gives in 2 Corinthians 11 of all the things he had gone through. Uh, beatings and shipwreck and uh, imprisonments, beaten to death at Derby and Lystra, and all these things that he, he suffered. But he, he speaks of them as being a part of the sufferings of Christ. In fact, it's a kind of a strange verse here because of the, the language of the verse, making up this uh, which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. Uh, it almost sounds like, well, didn't, didn't Jesus do enough? Of course he did enough. He finished everything there. He's just saying that this is, this is an addendum to that suffering. What, what began in our master will certainly follow through with his believers. And Jesus warned before he was crucified, if they've done this to the master, what will they do to the servants? It's not something that should shock or surprise us. As Peter said, it's some strange thing that this should happen. Uh, so it's to be anticipated. And even though we're living in a time where we don't know anything about this kind of persecution, it could easily arise, we can easily see how it can happen now in our generation, because the next generation rising up is so godless uh, and in many ways hates uh, the cause of Christ. Now some of these radical uh, feminists apparently were protesting at churches uh, this morning. They didn't come up here, but I mean, uh, they, 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 they must have the liberty to kill their baby. I mean, this is something that the, the, it is a sacrament to liberals. Uh, these are evil people. They're, they're, they're demons that live amongst us. They're demoniac. And their minds are, are filled with this. So, uh, so they're mad at this point, angry. Uh, and when I use the word mad, I'm using it in its proper sense. I mean, they're out of their minds. Uh, this is something uh, that we can expect now. If it, uh, maybe now it's just placards in front of a church or whatever, but the, that, that can easily break out into violence at some point. Uh, so we can maybe begin to apprehend what the future may hold for believers. Uh, none of this should f frighten us in any fashion because the Lord will give us what we need at the hour when it's needful. Then the very curious verse here in 2 Corinthians where he says, and our, our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall you be also of the consolation. 
So this verse that we have before us, is, uh, you know, it speaks of suffering, but the, the sufferings of, of this world, this, this time that we're living in temporal moment, it's not even worthy to be compared with the reward that's in store for the believers. This becomes now the hope of the believers, no matter what they may endure here. Amen. So these images that I used of the um, uh, martyrs in the first century, Nero put them, uh, uh, dipped their uh, feet in bitumen, tar, and then he tied them to a post and he lit them uh, so that they burned, and they burned uh, as uh, for his festivals. Uh, and pagans uh, delighted in seeing the Christians burn up like this. So, uh, so they got, but it was temporary. Jesus even said, fear not him who can destroy your body after this. You have nothing he can do. But you fear him who destroys body and soul in hell. So we're partakers of the sufferings, but we'll also be partakers of the consolation. And the consolation is so much the greater that it's not worthy to be compared with the suffering that's in this world. So this consolation that he speaks of here, again, sufferings of this present time, whatever we're going through, not worthy to be compared with the glory. There we are jumping up and down, you see. <laughs> and that's our consolation, right? <laughs> They're shouting. Now that leads us to a, a point that's very important for us to reestablish every so often. And that is, why, why is God letting this happen? Or another way of putting it, why does God permit suffering? Why does it allow it? This is one of the main arguments of the skeptics of our generation. You better be armed with an answer because they're demanding these answers. Let's not forget that we have a generation now that has been unschooled, untutored. The young people primarily are not sent to Sunday school. They're not, they don't come to church. Uh, they're raised by pagan parents, so they don't know much. And as a result, all they're learning is what they learn in school, which is communism, socialism, uh, everything else that goes along with their brainwashing techniques. And so you have to understand that they've been taught to be belligerent towards the attitude of God. They've been taught by atheists that uh, what kind of a God lets these kind of things happen? And that sows the doubt in the heart and the mind. Because really, it is a problem. It's the problem of suffering. But it's the most ancient of problems. And it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And we have an answer to those problems. But they are not necessarily satisfactory answers. They do, we're not satisfied when we hear some of these things because it doesn't uh, placate our unease about a loving God that permits this kind of thing to happen. So uh, we would go to the oldest book written, which isn't Genesis. It's Job. So Job is, uh, we consider him a contemporary with Abraham. So this is well before Moses. And uh, so who's the writer of Job? That is, I guess, to some degree contestable. But let's assume that it was Job. Uh, in which case, uh, we have the oldest book ever written. And in, in, in it, of course, is the problem of suffering. It is a major polemic about suffering, as a matter of fact. And we spent weeks, months, and so forth, almost, I guess, a, a year and some, maybe two years, going through the book of Job on Wednesday nights. Some of you that were here uh, and remember perhaps some of these lessons that I'm just going to review at this point. So what we have is Satan here appearing before God in the first chapter. Uh, and the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Which just means, where have you been? Where, where, what have you been doing? What are you up to? Angels, all angels, and Satan is but a fallen angel. All angels have to give report to God. Uh, they have a, uh, uh, an assignment each morning. The guardian angels are sent forth as ministering spirits to the heirs of righteousness. So uh, here's Satan insinuating himself in the uh, queue, the angelic queue that's appearing before God. And, uh, and God uh, has now asked all the other angels, uh, where have you been, what have you been doing? And, and they give the assignment, I've been down protecting that clumsy oaf down there, you know, that uh, does this thing and that and so forth. He should have died 20 times, but I've been protecting him. And the, and the Lord says, well done, you know, and now here's tomorrow's assignment. And the, now here's Satan comes and appears with them. And he says, well, whence comest thou? What, uh, and he said, uh, from going uh, to and fro and up and down in the earth. So walking up and down in it. So he, he, he's saying, I've been everywhere. He's a roaring lion. He walketh about seeking him who may devour. 
uh, with uh, demonic and frenetic energy. The devil never gives up. He is relentless. Uh, I tell you what, uh, you go ahead and rest if you want, but I'm going to tell you what, the devil isn't at rest. He's at all times seeing what he can do, finding our vulnerabilities, doing the best he can to pull us back into perdition. And so the believer is instructed to be uh, sober. The believer is instructed to watch. The believer is instructed to arm himself with the whole armor of God. Amen. Having done all to stand. So we understand that the, this enemy now, is uh, he has uh, evil designs for us. So he's been up and down to and fro. So north and south, east and west, right? Uh, and the Lord uh, said unto him, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, one that feareth God and eschewth evil? Uh, he said, You've got to... Uh, I've got somebody here, a true son of God. Here's a man that really wants to walk with the Lord. And, uh, but he's just a man, isn't he? Like me, like you. Uh, Job is not perfect in the sense of absolute perfection. He's perfect in the sense that he has sought the Lord and he has, uh, desires in, in some ways to be more and more like conformed to the image of God. And that's all the word perfect means relative to believers. So uh, Satan says, well, doth Job fear God for naught? In other words, uh, don't you pay him to serve you? I mean, you've given him everything. His life is a, a life of ease. He hasn't gone through any troubles or problems. So uh, doth Job fear God for naught? I mean, it's a rhetorical question. He, uh, Job, what Satan is suggesting is you've been too easy. You've made it too easy for him to believe in you. You have not really put him to any kind of a test. Here you create man with a free will. And then you stack the deck. I mean, that's really what the devil's accusing God of. By the way, just so you understand the audacity of the devil, that he would even dare utter an expression before Almighty God, a God that could incinerate him in a second. But we see how Satan is. So if you think he's going to leave you alone, forget it. Um, and he, so he says, Hast thou not uh, put a hedge about him and about his house? about all that he hath on every side. You've given him everything. What else could he ask for? But the Lord said, uh, all right, so you want to put him to the test. So he lets him, lets him have a reign over. And that, that in, in essence, is what the problem of sin and suffering is all about. The fact that God, who is not commissioning the suffering, is permitting it. A sovereign God can stop anything he wants to. And we can concede that point to the skeptic that argues if he is the omnipotent God, he could stop this in a moment. There is no doubt about that. Their assessment of that is correct. So why doesn't he becomes the issue? And the answer there is, and I give you the simple answer in two words, free will. It all has to do with free will. So the Lord says to Satan, behold, all that he hath is in thine hand uh, and only upon himself. Put not forth thine hand. So you can do everything but kill him. So Satan, he figures, I've got enough here. Uh, I'll be able to make Job curse him for sure. And so he comes down, he takes his uh, properties. He takes uh, uh, all of his land ownings. He takes his children and destroys it all. Job is left with, with nothing. One moment he has everything. He's on top of the world. Everything now is taken from him. And we find him there with sackcloth and ashes and, uh, and blessing God. The Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not with his lips, no charge God foolishly. So, so we see what Satan's design is, and that is to put us to the test. And so, believing friends, listen, we're all going to be put through various tests. If you haven't been through a test yet, it's on its way. And, uh, and it, it will not be easy. These are not simple things uh, that we go through. Uh, we might uh, uh, along the way hear Satan whisper the question in our, in our heart, in our mind, why does God permit evil? Why does he let this happen? Uh, and that's a, that's a question that we have to come up with at some point. Now in 2 Corinthians 12, you know, the apostle Paul was taken up to heaven. He saw the glory and uh, immediately he was uh, smitten with a thorn in the flesh. He doesn't tell us what the thorn in the flesh was. And I'm glad he didn't, because if he did, then people would uh, say, well, that, that's what Paul had, but I have something worse than that. So, so instead, he just kind of speaks generically of suffering. He's gone through some kind of physical suffering, a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan, now he's, he's uh, telling us, of course, ascribing this to the devil. 
uh, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So Paul saw a purpose in the suffering. And if you, ne if you do not see purpose in suffering, then, then uh, you're a target for the devil. He's going to come after you and he's going to fill you with all sorts of doubt about uh, the veracity of God's word, his promises, uh, whether his word is true, whether he even exists. And so it's best for us always to take the tack that uh, uh, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He doesn't have to give me an explanation or anybody else. And I, I've learned also over the years just to say, uh, he doeth all things well. So I'd, uh, he's not to be accused uh, in any fashion. And uh, he'll explain himself to us in due time. Uh, if, if we need an explanation, and many people think that they will need an explanation. Why did my husband die? Why did, my, uh, why did I lose my job? Why was I in this terrible accident? Why did I get cancer? Why? And it goes on and on. And people think that the, God owes them some kind of an answer. And much better for us to walk by faith. Uh, and so Paul had the thorn in the flesh. Uh, we might get to this a little later on if we have any time, but what that thorn in the flesh might be, it's kind of interesting. We sang tonight for Maggie uh, that song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, Oh, What a Foretaste of Glory Divine. It was written by Fanny Crosby, who wrote, uh, someone estimated over 5,000 hymns. Um, she was born blind. I think she was born blind. I, she might have received something early in childhood that blinded her, but she wrote, if... if if they do not, we meet with uh, laws. We grieve the Spirit of Christ by our complaints and murmurings and repinings. Let that just sink, sink down. We have many complaints, and uh, you know, the, the world seems to love this. I mean, we, we talk to people, and we say, how are you? Uh, it's a greeting, but you can make a mistake if you ask people how they are, because you've got a half an hour on your hands of all the terrible things they're going through and so forth. Far better for us not to rehearse all of our complaints and our murmurings. Uh, when someone says, how are you? I, I think if you really have a Christian perspective, you would say, I, I'm blessed of God every day of my life. Uh, do I have problems? Of course, everybody in the world has problems. Uh, physical uh, troubles, the older you get, the more you have. But far better for us not to rehearse our repinings and our murmurings and so on, our complaints. She didn't. We should not dishonor God by the mournful relation of trials that appear grievous. All trials that are received as educators will produce joy. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. The whole religious life will be uplifting, elevating, ennobling, fragrant, and with good words and works. There's joy that no language or thought can express it comes from His pres presence divine. And when in His likeness at last I awake, its fullness I know by mine. So, uh, th those are some of her thoughts, and uh, you know she she practiced what she wrote in those hymns, and of course now she sees so much the better in glory. <clears throat> Back to the skeptics of the world. Of course, skepticism begins in, with Satan, and it begins as early as the creation of man. Adam and Eve certainly had to doubt God when Satan said, "Oh, you know, you're not going to die if you." Who told you that? It's God who's, you know, he's got an evil motive. He's afraid you'll be like him. He doesn't want any competition. I mean, what was he suggesting? And Adam and Eve fell for this. So you can understand the skepticism. The idea of doubting God began very early. But the Greeks became uh, perfectors of that philosophy, as a matter of fact. And the school of Epicurus. Now, you know that there were the Epicureans and the Stoics uh, that Paul meets there on Mars Hill. And they're debaters, you know, and they argue back and forth all the time. So, you know something about Epicurus, who uh, essentially is the father of the Epicureans. And the word itself now, Epicurean, actually has become uh, a, an English a modified word. In, a, in essence, we use it. In daily syntax, we speak of an Epicurean delight. We, we sit at a feast, and, uh, but we're really speaking of the Epicureans who were very much given to the lust of the flesh. Uh, their perspective was existential. Live for the moment. Live now. There's nothing beyond. So enjoy yourself. Uh, take all the pleasures you can get. That sort of thing. Uh, just like the old beer commercial, grab all the gusto you can get. You know, that idea. What, what was that beer Miller High Life or Low Life or whatever it was. So that's what it... So we have Epicurus, and he said, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? 
See, so he puts the question, Ray. Then, well, he's not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Well, then he's malevolent, an evil God, right? Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? Now, we have permutations of that philosophy today. Sam Harris, who's one of the four horsemen they call themselves, he said the same thing. There's no new thing under the sun, Solomon, uh, Solomon told us uh, in Ecclesiastes. He said either God can do nothing to stop catastrophes like this, or he doesn't care to, or he doesn't exist. God is either imp impotent, evil, or imaginary. Take your pick and choose wisely. Uh, so what is that? It's nothing more than uh, what Epicurus had said. But instead he writes a book and makes millions of dollars doing it and uh, fills college minds with this kind of tripe. I mentioned the four horsemen, didn't I? Uh, we're not talking about the ones in Revelation 6. We're talking about the evil ones of the world here. And, and initially, you might go back to Karl Marx, who was the founder of communism and the, communi the writer of the Communist Manifesto. Uh, Bernie Sanders, probably one of his, e his heroes. Many of the Democrats uh, idolize the writings of Marx and want to uh, put them in action here. Now, we see the manifestation of what Marxism brings, because that's what uh, Putin's Russia is all about. That's what uh, President Xi in China, that's who they are. They're Marxists. So, indeed, uh, the, this is a very evil man and an atheist. Then we have Nietzsche, you know, the German philosopher that said that God is dead. We have Sigmund Freud. Uh, that essentially uh, said there, there's no sin, uh, that, that we have this puritanical notion of right and wrong, and there is, you know, he's the inventor of uh, relative philosophy, that no, nobody can determine what is right or wrong. And then Sartre, who was the, uh, the writer of existentialism and uh, the notion of you live for the moment, live for now. Uh, again, that was no original thought, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. I mean, this is an ancient uh, saw. But the modern uh, four horsemen would be uh, Dawkins, right, Sam Harris that we've already mentioned, Christopher Hitchens. I showed the, the film, was it Easter time, where Hitchens, he was the atheist, you know, that uh, uh, all of a sudden smitten with throat cancer. I mean, he smoked several packs of cigarettes every day and was a, a, a habituated uh, alcoholic. But uh, yeah, when he died, so now we only have three horsemen, I guess, right? and uh, Bennett, David Bennett. So uh, they're called the Four Horsemen. And uh, they, they like to use biblical terminology, uh, but they, uh, of course, reject everything that's in the Bible. And uh, they uh, have become very popular to the modern thinkers. You know, in Revelation, you'll find that when the terrible plagues come one upon the other, the 16th chapter, you've got one a terrible plague coming uh, in succession and simultaneously, uh, we have it. So, uh, so one plague comes, and then the next, and, and that continues as another plague comes upon it, and then another and another. You know, it's layered in that sense. And what do we have? The inhabitants of the earth now who have taken the mark of the beast and who are unbelievers. And what do they do as all this happens? They blaspheme the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. You know, uh, suffering and terrible things that happen are often um, the stimulation that brings people to eternal life and salvation. It brings them to repentance. Uh, or it can turn the heart even harder away from God. And it continues here. Uh, they blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. So there's all this that we find in the scripture about suffering and, and uh, that it's an experience that uh, it certainly isn't pleasant. But why does God permit it? Well, he permits it because it becomes an ultimate test of whether we will trust him or not. At, at the end of which he does promise that he'll restore us. The whole story of Job is, is really a lesson in this uh, moral teaching. That at the end, what does God do? After Job has gone through terrible agonies and physical pain and uh, the loss of friends, his, uh, his wife comes and kind of kicks him in the side, uh, you know, uh, taunts him to curse God and die. She's taken the typical, you know, uh, skeptical pers perspective, blaspheme God and die. But he refuses to do that. You speak like one of the foolish women, he says. 
Shall we not receive good at the hand of the Lord and likewise evil? And that's when he says, uh, we, you know, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, that expression that we use. So suffering is going to be an experience, but only for a season. And our text is telling us this. The sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We have an ex expectation, in other words, that there will be a recompense for whatever we've endured here below. So, suffering comes with the freedom to choose. So I said, look, the simple answer to people, and they, they, I'm not saying that they'll receive it, but it is the answer. As to why does God, who is omnipotent and who is loving and merciful, why does he permit evil? Why does he permit suffering? And the answer is, and a two-word answer, free will. God ordained that man would be free. And as a result, as Satan brings up a salient point before the Almighty, he said, you put a hedge about Job. You've made it too easy for him. This is not a true test at all. Take it all away and he'll curse you. That was what Satan believed. He thought that that was in the heart of humanity, and he's partially right. There are many people that uh, were raised to believe in God. In fact, the four horsemen, every one of them had gone to church earlier on. I mentioned Christopher Hitchens. You know, he and his brother were both, uh, they were, both went to Sunday school. And um, Hitchens becomes an atheist, and his brother became a strong Christian. So out of the same womb. So uh, it's all a matter of choice. You know, you have two thieves, one on the right side, one on the left. One believes, one goes to hell when they die. So uh, suffering comes with the freedom to choose. So loving parents long to protect their children from unnecessary pain, but wise parents know the danger of overprotection. They know that the freedom to choose is at the heart of what it means to be human. That a world without choice would be worse than a world without pain. Worse yet would be a world populated by people who could make wrong choices without feeling any pain. No one is more dangerous than the liar, thief, or killer who doesn't feel the harm he is doing to himself and to others. But you might, might also say that pain can, can warn us of a danger. I don't know how many people uh, that, I, that I've ministered to, you know, that they said they had the sudden pain or they had this problem or affliction. They, uh, they saw blood in their urine or something like that. And, and that they went to the doctors, right? And they, they find out they've got something here that they, they've got to deal with. And, and in some cases, they can actually uh, stop the situation. And had they not had that warning sign, they would have died. So uh, we all have to have a, a kind of a wake-up call, so to speak. And that's what pain does. And thus God permits it because we're in a, uh, a fallible body. We have a body here that's not going to live forever. It's, it's subject to a curse. And so we have to have some warning signs, and that's what pain is. So we don't, we don't like it, but we hate pain, especially in those we love. Yet without discomfort, the sick wouldn't go to a doctor. Worn out bodies would go uh, get no rest. Criminals would fear the law. Uh, children would laugh at correction without uh, pangs of conscience, the daily dissatisfaction of boredom. The empty longing for significance, people who are made to find satisfaction in an eternal father would settle for far less. But the example of Solomon, you can read those uh, accounts there. Another way of understanding suffering, it takes us to the edge of eternity. If death is the end of everything, then a life filled with suffering isn't fair. But if the end of this life brings us to the threshold of eternity, then the most fortunate people in the universe are those who discover through suffering this life is not all we have to live for. You know, we've all encountered uh, uh, people that were born with Down syndrome. You know, what a shame it is. You know, these doctors, uh, because they use amniocentesis and other processes, they can find out before the baby's born, they say, oh, you're going to have a Down syndrome baby. And, uh, and so uh, people hear that and they abort the baby. And they're advised to do so. You, don't, you know, you don't want the, these uh, people to be a burden to society, that sort of thing. But I've ministered to, and you have probably as well, the happiest people that you have ever met. Am I, am I telling the truth? They're the happiest people you have ever met. And they don't seem to have the care in the world. And you think to themselves, I mean, they're so debilitated. In some cases, the, if it's extreme, they have to be fed and everything else, and clothed and whatever else, bathed. Um, uh, their minds aren't where it ought to be. Uh, and yet they're as happy as, as, as a person can be. Uh, you say, well, that's, you know, part of the disease. Well, if that's it, you know, we can all use a little bit of it, I'd have to think. But they, 
suffering, as a result of suffering here below, uh, the glory that shall be revealed in us. There's a, there's a wonderful thought about free will and understanding this whole thing and the idea of accountability and young people that, that are too young to really understand the great abstracts of eternity. Uh, they belong to the Lord. You don't have to worry about getting uh, some water on their head and a priest exercising a demon out of them. No, no. They're, they're children. They're innocent. They belong to the Lord. But they'll come to a point in their lives when they become teenagers or whenever it might be where they have to make a choice for themselves whether they're going to believe or reject. Uh, at that point, they're on their own. But up to that point, we call them innocent. Uh, so uh, they, they're not, we're not saying that they're, they're sinless. They're not sinless, as a matter of fact. They have a sin nature. But they don't understand the consequences of it. And they certainly can't understand necessarily the abstract of Christ taking their sins to the cross. But once they come to that place of maturity of thought, whenever that is, and I think it's different for every individual, then certainly at that point now they have to make their decision. And I, I believe there's a great overlap as far as age is concerned. But I also think those that are born with some retardation and some uh, that are, uh, their minds are stilted in whatever degree, uh, I would have to put them in the category of, of innocent. Yet, that said, they seem to be able to comprehend things eternal. And that, that's an amazing part of it, isn't it? So you would call them simple. They're simple people. Uh, and yet so simple that like a child, it's easy for them to embrace things eternal. Uh, and they don't have to deal with all the doubts that Satan can put in a person's mind that is now refined, you know, and educated and so forth. And all the questions that we demand of God that he answer these things. And uh, they don't see any contradiction in the nature of God. They're happy to believe as children would believe. Um, I've got uh, dozens of points here. But so pain loosens our grip on this life. That, that certainly has to be true as well. Suffering gives the opportunity to trust God as we found the life of Job. And of course... This, I think, above all other things, is that God didn't spare his own son from suffering. So why should, he expect, why should I expect that I'd be spared from any suffering either? If Jesus went through this and God did not come to his rescue, should I always expect him to come to my rescue? So ultimately, he does. He raises Jesus from the dead. And ultimately, in your life and mine, he will give us a satisfactory compensation for whatever we went through. The consolation. So the sufferings of this world not worthy to be compared with the consolation and what God is going to give us as a result. So uh, he's thus able to, um, to help us through our suffering. So God comfort, uh, God's comfort is greater than our suffering. And we can learn this, of course, through various passages in 2 Corinthians in particular. Uh, Jesus taught us the greatest prayer of all, and that is, thy will be done. So if you wanted to find the perfect prayer, Jesus utters it in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, the cup is coming. It's, to, it's a premature death from what I understand. And Jesus is about to, uh, you know, he's sweating blood, literally. So he is uh, hemorrhaging. So uh, take this cup from my lips. Well, God answers him because those strong prayers were heard, Hebrews tells us. And that would mean to me that he was saved from death at that moment. Not from the cross. This is what Jesus longed for. He needed to get, be lifted up. He had to be uh, fulfill the scripture. So he would be pierced. So he would have to go through that. So, so uh, through the process, though, he surrendered to the will of God. If he should die now, he dies now. He doesn't argue with God and say, wait, wait a minute, the plan is for me to get to the cross. No, he just says, thy will be done. If I'm to die now, then let it be. Thy will be done. Nevertheless, you know, thy will be done, he says. But... He did pray, take this cup from my lips, and God heard him and said, no, you're going to die now. You'll die in the prescribed fashion. So always acknowledging the sovereignty of God, always saying, uh, God knows what is best. Uh, it's not what I would choose for myself. It's what he has chosen for me. So Isaiah 45 says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace. And this is a problem for people, create evil. And uh, we can go into a wording here and the, the word uh, if we want to go to the original language and so forth uh, I don't think we need to do that we understand the word evil here and it's a rather generic term and what it simply means in this case is that God is sovereign over evil uh, th that he didn't create it in an active sense the fact is the and this is an argument that you'll hear also well if God is good and God is perfect and God is loving why did he create a devil 
I don't know if you've ever heard this, but I mean, I've heard it so many times. Why did he create a devil, they'll say. And I'll say, well, you know, this might be hard to understand, but he wasn't created as a devil. He was created perfect. There wasn't anything wrong. He had everything you could have. So, so God didn't create him as a devil. Well, then how did he become a devil? Well, I have two words for that. Free will. He had his choice. And God, who does not make uh, automatons or robots, he makes people with free will. We choose what we want to be, and, uh, and we live with that choice for eternity. So we always acknowledge the sovereignty of God. And even in the case here where he says, I make peace and I create evil. Now he'll use, uh, in other words, everything will finally redound to the glory of God. Everything that happens in this world all the circumstances of life and suffering and misery and death and everything else will finally redound to the glory of God. It will all be to the glory of God at the end. So he says, I create, uh, and I, the Lord, do all these things. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe unto him that uh, striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, What makest thou or thy work? He hath no hands. Uh, you know, we're going to get into this very interesting uh, expression that's used in the book of Romans when we get uh, into the later chapters. So uh, we'll have much more to say about it then. So Colossians also tells us, For by him are all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. So we see the totality of Christ's sovereignty over everything that he has made. The devil couldn't do anything to Job without God's permission to do it. Amen. So God permits him. God doesn't create the evil directly, but he permits the evil. And that's really what that expression is all about. He, he allows it for a testing so that man indeed has a free choice and has not been coerced into believing. Now, we, of course, as Americans, we all love our freedom and liberty and so on. In fact, uh, uh, so much so that probably we continue to spread the pandemic further than it needed to be spread. I'm not putting up that mask on. Not me. You know, I'm not going to do that. No, it's government trying to do me. <laughs> on and on it goes, even when it doesn't make any sense. There are people that uh, are arguing for their freedoms. I'm going to put it, nobody can put a needle in my arm and so forth. Same people I know wouldn't take the needle in their arm, shot up heroin when they were young. But at any rate, all, all I can tell you is we're born innately with that desire, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And in fact, that's what we find in the young people as they grow older. And, and that's what we, we have to pray that God gives us enough wisdom to direct them in right directions. Because it's so easy for them with that attitude to choose the wrong way Amen. and to demand their right. I, you know, I'm 18. I'll leave the house. I'll, I, I'm going to go on my, you're not going to let me do this. I'll do this. And that attitude, it's so prevalent, especially in American society. So, um, but we understand that God is sovereign over everything. And it won't be until you submit to that sovereignty that you sublimate your will to his will that you'll finally find peace, peace with God. The Lamentations tell us, so uh, uh, who, who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth it not? Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. Wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? And uh, Daniel gives us this word of wisdom and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? And Psalm 145 adds this, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all of his works. So when we f find Job at the end of, the, uh, of this terrible diatribe that goes on in heaven and, and with his f friends, you know, the three friends that come to argue with him, uh, it's, it's Job who shows us a meek spirit of surrender. The Lord gave, the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this, Job, sin not or charge God foolishly. All right, so next week when we get into the latter portion of this 18th verse, we're certainly going to see about the glory that shall be revealed in us. The glory. So Lord, uh, you bless us here tonight. Uh, fill us up with your word and understanding that word, Lord, is so critical and so important. 
Uh, thankfully, Lord, you said, uh, Jeremiah 3.15, I will give them uh, pastors after my own heart. They shall feed them with uh, understanding. So help us, Father, to indeed understand this good word. We pray, Father, that it would indeed be a feeding to us and that, Lord, we will learn how to submit to your perfect will at all times. Lord, it seems to be human to complain, but we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to modify our complaints. It's offensive to you, Lord, to hear them. Help us to be grateful people, be satisfied with our lot in life, whatever that might be. To be glad, Lord, that whatever we endure here below will be rewarded a thousandfold in the world to come. And so, Lord, uh, we also want to thank you that we live in such a, a glorious place, Lord, here in America where it's fr we're free to come and go, we're free to, to come and worship. That's not the case all over the world. And Lord, it might soon uh, be that we're persecuted for it here. As we look uh, back at what the church has endured through the centuries of time, uh, we are certainly a grateful people, Lord. We're not enduring anything close to this today. But if it should change, Lord, that you would empower us and prepare us for whatever change comes. We thank you for our Lord and our Savior who loved us and shed his blood on the cross, who willingly went to the cross and did not shy away from the cup of death when it came at Calvary. And there he drank uh, that cup to its dregs and gave to us, uh, as a result, redemption and eternal life. So we praise and thank you for the goodness of God and. Uh, Lord, help us to give a good defense to those that ask of the reason of hope that dwelleth in us. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. and You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation.
Come into my heart, Lord.